Welcome everyone. I'm Susan Glassman. Um, we are joined tonight with two speakers, so Elliot and Katie, if you'd both turn on your video. And um, Corinne, if you would turn on your video now too, that would be great. So I'm, as I said, I'm Susan Glassman. I am the director of the Wagner Free Institute of Science, and I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to our weeknights at the Wagner Digital Talk Series. Tonight, we're pleased to have two speakers, historians and authors, Elliot Shore and Katie Rawson, who will talk about a very important cultural institution, the restaurant. Their recent book, Dining Out, A Global History of Restaurants, looks at the role that restaurants have played in the history of technology, race, gender, ethnicity, politics, and almost any area of human endeavor you can imagine. And they will be sharing stories across time and around the world and give you an idea of this sort of massive undertaking, undertaking that they did in looking globally at restaurants. It seemed particularly timely to hit this topic as our own ability to dine out, like so much of the rest of our daily lives, has fallen casualty to the pandemic. So we're really looking forward to Elliot and Katie giving us some perspective on the places where we go to eat and where we do so much more. A few words about the Wagner before we start. Um, for those who have never been or for their first time on a program, uh, we are a natural history museum and educational institution located in Philadelphia. We were founded in 1855 and we have a dual mission to teach contemporary science to the public and also to interpret and preserve the Wagner's historic building, which is a time capsule of 19th century science. Pretty amazing, and someday when we reopen, you, we hope you'll all come visit. Tonight's talk is just one of many kinds of programs that we offer, and as stated in our name, Wagner Free Institute, our programs are all free to make them truly accessible to everyone. We are located in a National Landmark building, which you can kind of get a glimpse of from the picture behind me. Um, and it houses a museum, a library, a historic lecture hall where most of our programs normally take place. So on to tonight. We're thrilled to welcome our two guest speakers, Elliot Shore and Katie Rawson. As I said, they are co-authors of the recently published Dining Out, A Global History of Restaurants. Elliot is many things, a historian, a widely published author, a librarian, and a organizational leader um, of many organizations locally and nationally. Most recently, he served as executive director of the Association of Research Libraries, a nonprofit that represents 124 research libraries across the US and Canada. He's professor emeritus of history at Bryn Mawr College, where he also served as the director of libraries. And before that, he was director, library director at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Elliot has his PhD from Bryn Mawr College and MS, an MS in Library um, Science from Drexel, and also an MA in International History from the London School of Economics. This gives you an idea of why he covers such a wide swath of um, amazing topics. Um, he, as I said, he's published widely across a dizzying array of fields, um, and I'll just give you a sampling. History of advertising, history of publishing, history of radicalism. Uh, he's looked a lot at German American culture and history. And of course, most recently, this big, big look at the history of restaurants. Katie is the Director of Learning Innovation at the University of Pennsylvania. She previously was the Humanities Librarian for English at Emory University, and prior to that, Coordinator for Digital Research at Penn. She has her PhD from Emory in in their Institute of Liberal Arts and an MA in English from the University of Mississippi, Oxford. She's written extensively about food, its social and cultural meanings and manifestations, including food in Faulkner, as in William, labor and equality at the Waffle House food chain, and about American food ways. She also focuses on the use of data in the humanities and collaboration in academia. Katie also has the special distinction of having won the Door Prize when she attended the old Price is Right when Bob Barker was host. I'm really jealous of that, among other things. Um, 
Elliot's a very good friend of the Wagner and a member of our advisory board. We're meeting Katie for the first time and we hope it won't be the last, but we're grateful for them for joining us tonight and we know you'll enjoy the talk. Finally, a quick plug for the Wagner. This program, like almost everything we do, is free of charge and it's our mission, as I said, to make programs widely accessible. Somehow we've managed to do that for 165 years and we're intending to keep it going. So we've quickly adapted to make our programs available online, something we've never done before while, while the building's closed, um, but we need support to make that happen. So if you enjoy tonight's program, as we know you will, and would like to see more, we hope you'll consider making a donation or joining the Wagner. And I do wanna thank everyone who is already a member or who has contributed. You make it possible for us to do this work. So now I'm gonna turn the program over to Katie and Elliot. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, really quickly, I'm going to share my screen with everyone and then we'll get started. So tonight, we're going to talk about the history of restaurants in the context of our current moment. We'll begin with the origin of restaurants in cities before moving on to how restaurants have been using and innovating in technology to respond to the things in their environments like restaurants are doing now. Um, we're also going to talk about how women and Black people have shaped restaurant culture and responded to discrimination in restaurants. And we're going to end by looking at one story about a restaurant and a waiter during a historical crisis of uh, World War II. So let me just give a small introduction to how this book came to be. Um, and we believe it is the first book that has tried to take on the entire global history of restaurants, which of course is impossible. And we um, did it, we think, in a way that would be interesting to folks through stories and themes. And some of those themes you will um, we will talk to tonight. And as you can imagine, we will leave out a lot of stories and we hope you will um, come back to the book and, and read the rest of the stories. The, um, the beginnings of this book were in a, uh, the first actual real, um, really serious look at the history of food. And that uh, was done by Paul Friedman. And um, it's called Food, the History of Taste. And in that book, there was a, I did a um, chapter on dining out in the West. And this wonderful um, smallish press in London, Reaction Books, which I can only um, suggest to you as, as being a wonderful place to look for really interesting material, is interested in books that have scholarly precision, but are written for a general educated public. So that's what we tried to do with this book. and. Um, we hope that uh, you will enjoy it. Paul Friedman has done a couple of books you probably have heard of, um, beside the history of taste, of uh, 10 Restaurants That Changed America was one of the ones that just came out. <clears throat> and then he's done a history of American restaurants, which actually came out after the other one. So he's, um, he is probably the dean of the history of restaurants. So there's a lot of lore around what's considered the world's first restaurant. A lot of people tell the history of restaurants beginning in Paris in the 1700s, um, but in our book we actively didn't want to do that um, and didn't do that because that is in fact the history of restaurants that is longer than that. Instead, we started in major cities in China and in the Mediterranean, and we then we covered Paris in a chapter that also includes a lot of contested stories um, and a lot of gastronomic lore. And I want to throw this to you, Elliot. Uh, what is it about cities that makes them the places that breed our first restaurants? It's a good question. And before I try to answer that, I want to say what a restaurant is and why they haven't been around forever. If you think about what happens in a restaurant, the food is cooked for you. The, um, you get to order from a menu. You, in that menu, there's a price for what you're going to pay. 
you're served by someone else and you pay at the end of the meal and you have choices along the way and we never think about that because we've been in restaurants until recently or uh, most of our lives so that notion all of those pieces of the puzzle do not come together until the 11th century in China. And it's an interesting kind of a, a story of why all of those things finally come together there. And there are essentially, oh, four or five reasons um, for that. The, the Song Dynasty in the 11th century had two cities that were enormous. They're um, Kaifeng and Hangzhou. Both had more than a million inhabitants. And the, these million inhabitants were at the crossroads of a trading, um, the, the trading lanes in China. So if you think about, they had a million folks in 1100. Um, Paris was a pretty big city. It only had 300,000. Milan had 200,000 folks. And poor old London only had about 100,000 folks. So we're talking about a mega city in what would have been the Middle Ages in, um, in the West. So it's the size of the, um, the urban population, the notion that it's a trading center and therefore people are coming from everywhere in China. And um, the third thing that happens right away is ethnic restaurants. Um, the folks who came from the South wanted to eat Southern food. The folks that came from the North wanted to eat Northern food. And some people were um, itinerant traders and some people were wealthy merchants. So every kind of restaurant um, and every kind of food was available. And we know this, this is one of the interesting stories. We know this because the Chinese have kept records of all of their um, inhabitants and who lived where and what happened at each address. So we not only have the addresses of the restaurants, we have the menus of the restaurants and we have an extraordinary um, set of background material to look at. And folks in the, um, in the West had some inkling of this because Marco Polo writes about the Hangzhou restaurants and uh, many people thought it was fanciful but actually it can all be backed up by the work of the, um, uh, by, by the archives in China. So then we move, um, it takes 700 years until there are restaurants in the West. And for some of the same reasons, one reason I left out, or two reasons I left out with China are there were small, everyone had small denomination cash, which would have not been the case in medieval Europe. And the other thing was a loosening of the social orders. So the social orders in, in China were loosening under the Song Dynasty and um, all of those factors led to the creation of the restaurant. It takes until the 18th century in Paris for that to happen. This is the Palais Royal, um, which was actually built for Cardinal Richelieu and then uh, in the 17th century, and then was taken back, taken over by the, uh, or sold to the, um, the king. And then in the 1780s had um, reverted, uh, it was sold by the king to private um, investors. And it was kind of almost like a mall of restaurants in the 1780s. And they, the beginnings of restaurants in Paris are a little bit less clear because it wasn't that important actually for people to um, document that. They did not have the kind of record keeping that the Chinese had. And so there are uh, contesting stories of when exactly it happened and where it happens, but it happens probably in the 1760s. And within a few years, the entire rest of the panoply of what a restaurant culture was like um, develops. You can see this is um, another early restaurant um, in Paris and it's um, the Palais Royal was a palatial place. The um, restaurants there were palatial and here is another um, uh, palatial restaurant in France a little bit later. And then we have the uh, development of a very 
um, complete culture around restaurants, the culture of um, spectacle and the culture of uh, reviews of restaurants and uh, manners of how you should act in a restaurant. This is one of the most famous and crazy. Can we go back a little bit? This famous and crazy looking thing, it's a funerary feast. And this is the guy, Alexandre Balthazar Laurent Grimaud de la Ranier, who is responsible for the beginnings of all of these. Um, he's the first food critic. And he actually, um, for fun, had um, catered his own funeral put a coffin on the table, invited, and he wanted to see how many of his friends would show up, and then he um, had dinner with them. So he was kind of a cool guy, or a little bit strange. He then um, published a book that has all of the, um, essentially, it's a list of all the restaurants in Paris, and if they're good, and if they're not good, and if people didn't like him, of course, just like any reviewers, he, um, he kicked them out of, he either gave them a bad review or kicked them out of the book. So um, all of the kinds of things that we know about today happen in 18th century France. Um, the restaurant itself is uh, of the type that we're talking about, this elite restaurant that starts in Paris, um, becomes an export, um, an export from France. It becomes one of the things that France exports throughout the entire West and, and into the East as well. This is um, the first great cookbook, which um, comes out in the early 19th century. And then we start to see restaurants of this sort throughout the world, probably starting in the early 19th century. Um, and uh, there, there's um, one in, uh, in New York City by the 1820s and 30s, and there are hotel restaurants and uh, important restaurants all throughout um, Europe. And they all have French chefs using French recipes. This is the most famous restaurant in London, the Cafe Royale, where Oscar Wilde hung out and gained an enormous amount of weight. So this is the sort of the very quick history of the restaurant. So Katie, um, across the book, we talk about how people have used machines in restaurants, from the cafe mechanique to the automat. Why do you think it's important to tell these stories about technology? Yeah, I, I think it's important that we tell these stories because in part, I think it's important because they illuminate how labor works in restaurants. Um, and then they also illuminate how restaurants often change in response to new technology clearly, but also um, external conditions, which is something that we're seeing right now, right? We're watching yet another shift in the way that restaurants work. So some of the early technologies that we talk about as like ways that the restaurant becomes the things that we know um, is things like the invention of particular kinds of lamps. Um, so having gas lighting inside allowed people to stay out late, to eat dinner at night. It really changed culture. It also meant that you could light streets and that instead of it being that you would want to go home for dinner because otherwise you would like be in the dark with strangers, um, but instead it became something that was respectable and fashionable to be out in public in the night. We also talk a lot, um, and I think that it's important to really consider the back of the house. Um, so much of restaurant technology is, uh, is not the stuff that we as customers ever see, but it is the stuff that changes our entire experience. Um, so uh, gas stoves were just transformative for restaurants. They they did two main things. First of all, they made it so that everybody didn't die in the restaurant. Um, so before you had gas stoves, people were working over open fire. Uh, people who worked in restaurants actually often died young. Great chefs often died young because of uh, because of all the charcoal getting into their lungs. Um, and then also you can uh, you can maneuver fire so much more easily with a gas stove. So it even changes the cuisine that we have. Um, and then 
from that, there's like a whole litany of other little things that restaurants give us, like sink traps. So uh, um, Sawyer, who is like one of the chefs that we talk about in restaurant tours, one of the things that he helps invent is the sink trap because he gets tired of people in his kitchen spending all of their time cleaning out sink drains. Um, things like griddles and ketchup dispensers that are part of the 20th century and really transform how quickly food can be distributed and how uh, how uh, uh, how much alike we can make it, how homogenous it is. And then there are things that are part of our organizational technologies. So when we think about something like the Brigade de Cuisine, it's basically a way of running a kitchen that really transforms um, how many dishes can be made at once and who has skills in what kinds of um, of cuisines. But because we are in this very peculiar moment of COVID-19, one of the things we really wanted to tell a story about um, is the automat. So uh, in the book, we, we spend almost uh, half of a chapter on the automat. So automats are basically places where you go and instead of having a human give you your food, you put in your money into a machine and the machine magically gives you your food. Uh, so the very first auto automats um, were uh, actually much, much early. So we know that there were mechanical drink dispensers uh, definitely in the uh, 1700s and uh, perhaps back into ancient Greece. Um, and then uh, by the time we get to the early restaurants in Paris, there's this place called the Café Mécanique that has uh, an automatic coffee service, which is super popular. It's basically, people see it as like um, entertainment and kind of like a parlor game. So there are like crowds and crowds of folks coming to get uh, drinks that are served not by a waiter or waitress, but by the machine itself. And then in uh, 1896, we get the first real automats. So the kind of places like uh, Horn and Hard Arts. Uh, the first ones are in Germany in 1896. And then the first one comes to America in 1902. And it arrives in our fair city in Philly. Um, Joseph Horn had traveled to Germany. And when he was in Germany, he went to an automat. And he thought that it was just amazing. He thought Americans would love it. So he he went to the company that sold them Automat GmbH um, and ordered one and uh, they put it on a ship and it started across the ocean and it sank. So America had to wait just a little longer for its first Automat, but they shipped another version of it um, and people from the company even came over and helped install it. And it was a huge success. Uh, by 1941, there were 147 of them in the US across the Eastern coast. Um, and in part, part of the reason that they were popular is some of the same reasons that we see uh, this kind of touchless food experience being popular now. There was really this story about cleanliness and about food safety. The idea that, there, that it, they were places with like less germs. Um, uh, and I think the other fantasy was that, um, that it was like a workerless space. So you like didn't have to see labor at all, even though clearly people were still making food behind the scenes. As a person in an automat, you yourself were navigating the space, um, but, uh, but there, weren't, uh, there weren't workers there. And so there was also this like egalitarian sense and, and notion that people spread about like what it meant to go to the automat. I, I love this picture very, very much. Um, I think especially now when I know we are all missing going to restaurants, I do love that this man has brought his little dog to the automat. Um, and you'll see that for the most part, these people are doing okay with their social distancing. So the automat um, in some ways became a way not just for people to get food, but it also became a way of thinking in the food industry. So this notion of shifting the labor of food to the people who are eating it or to people uh, or to machines became really important. Um, and uh, uh, this is yet another version of that. So conveyor belt sushi was 
another space where people wanted to make sure that you didn't have to have waiters all the time. Uh, sushi is very expensive, and a guy named um, Yoshiaki uh, Shiryashi in, um, in Japan had a, a restaurant in the 1950s, and he was struggling a bit because sushi was expensive. Most of the people in the area that he lived in were factory workers. They couldn't afford it. So he went and toured at a beer factory and was like, wait, the way that they are moving beer around here. I could do that with sushi. And so he built his own little conveyor belt to put the sushi on so that he could have fewer staff in the restaurant and so that he could have more space for food and uh, less space for people. So it was like a counter situation. Um, and now, as you can see from this picture, it has just exploded into an industry in the same way that the automat did. Like, there was initially a purpose that was about business, but then there's like the secondary thing that is like the pleasure of interacting with a machine for food. And all of this at this point uh, seems actually to have some amount of uh, foresight to it. Uh, so this is a contemporary, uh, Automat. It, uh, it's an Itza. They actually closed down just a couple of years ago, but I think that this is becoming familiar to all of us, this notion of getting your food from a cubby, putting your order in through an app, um, and kind of like the touchless experience of dining. Katie, when we started writing this book, we knew that women would be an important piece of it. We tell stories about women actively working to make their lives better in and through food service across the past 400 years. Can you tell us a couple of the stories that really stand out to you and how you unearth them? Yeah, so um, women have always been in restaurants, but they haven't always been equally welcome. Um, so for a long time, there were separate dining rooms for men and women in many places um, or in lots of other places, like women just couldn't, respectable women just couldn't go into restaurants. Um, there was just the notion that like many restaurants weren't places for women to be. Um, and one of my favorite stories about women pushing back against this uh, comes from New York in 1907. Um, so uh, two women, Mrs. Blatch um, and, uh, and her friend, uh, they go to this restaurant called the Hoffman House. They come up, they are like, we want to come in. And basically the uh, guy who's running it is like, no, you can't come in at all. Um, and instead of just turning away, uh, they basically decided that they were going to sue. They decided that they didn't think that this was fair. Um, they were both uh, kind of famous suffragists. Um, and so uh, they sued. And the sad part was that the court, um, the court agreed that they shouldn't not be able to go to the restaurant. But instead it said, that you had to have a separate dining room, right? So it continued this kind of American legacy of thinking that having separate spaces for two kinds of people is like an acceptable solution uh, to, to access, um, which all of us know isn't a long-term successful solution. Uh, and eventually, clearly, this changed over time. But I think it's an interesting example of how, how people uh, have been barred access and for a long time. But the stories that I really love uh, that we explore in the book are about women who are waitresses and who are entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, this, I think, is just a beautiful picture uh, from Japan. So starting in Japan, there were waitresses in the 17th century. Um, and uh, many of them are at places that are along these kinds of roads that people travel on, right? And so lots of these women are probably simultaneously um, uh, sex workers and also waitresses. So they're called meshiona. Um, and it's unclear. Uh, 
so there probably were some of these women who really were just waitresses, um, and some of them also probably were in the sex trade. Uh, at the same time, there were places like this place in this illustration, which clearly isn't, uh, is mostly just like a family restaurant. You can see that the woman that is serving food has a baby on her back. Um, so even while there is like this long history of uh, women on the edge of respectability around being waitresses and people assuming that people who are waitresses are also sexualized. Um, we also know that there's like a long history of women who are just making ends meet and even sex workers who are just making ends meet. Uh, in the, I actually am going to do this in a slightly, I'm going to flip my slides. Um, so in the 19th and 20th century, we see women who become waitresses really as a way to, uh, to have their own money and their own identity and to have their own lives. And in, um, in Japan and Taiwan, there is this whole culture of the Jokyu cafes, which are these cafes that young women work in um, and uh, they are like people across the media are just terribly upset about what's happening with these young women who are um, who are becoming westernized and they like talk with men and they like move out of their homes and like what on earth is happening and I think that this is like such a really beautiful illustration of these two young women who are who are just working right which is like one of the things about this is that like these women were women who were establishing their lives and they're part of a longer lineage of this happening with women waitresses. So in the 19th century um, in America, uh, Harvey girls were basically the waitresses for these, um, these railroad restaurants. So they were restaurants that would have been at railroad stations. And in some ways they're like the first waitresses that are really considered like middle class and respectable in America. So high end places before then would have had waiters um, and low end waitresses were often, as I said, uh, like demeaned or maligned. Um, and so these Harvey girls were often women from the East and they had decided to go West and, uh, and find themselves these jobs that also were like very kept in, in a certain sort of way. Um, and my favorite story about this is the story of uh, Janet Ferrer and Alice Stackhouse. Um, so historian Leslie Poling Kemp's tells their story and basically uh, Ferrier was a Scottish woman and she was told by a doctor that she was going to go blind and so she was like well I'm going to see the world before I go blind so as a 14 year old she came to America um, and she was working in a Florida resort and met um, met Alice Stackhouse and they were both like you know what we really want to do is we want to see the world so we are going to go and be Harvey House girls they got a job at the same place and they basically spent the next 40 years uh, working together to make enough money to travel and as soon as they would make enough money to travel they would quit their jobs and they would go and travel the world uh, and then when they ran out of money they would go back Back and work at the Harvey House some more. Um, trying to decide, Elliot, do you think we're good on time to tell I the think, story of Chifa? I think if you tell it quickly, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of thinking about people who are entrepreneurs, one of my favorite other stories about women entrepreneurs is about the story of Chifa. Um, so Chifa is basically the national food of Peru. It is a mixture of Chinese food and traditional Peruvian food. Um, and it actually comes out of a moment in the 19th century when thousands of Cantonese men came to Peru to work on sugar plantations. Uh, these men came from a culture where they often cooked for themselves, where men were often the cooks in their homes as well, and that they cooked for their families. But then they married all of these Peruvian women, native Peruvian, Spanish Peruvian, and African Peruvian women, um, who often also were cooks. And so you end up with this fusion cuisine, 
But then many of these women were also already like small shop owners or food store owners. And so they come together with these men and they start opening up these restaurants that serve this kind of fusion cuisine. And it really, uh, it takes off. It starts out in um, ethnic enclaves, but then becomes popular across, uh, across cities and really across all of Peru. And I, I like having this picture because uh, you can see that the man is clearly cooking, but he is cooking in part because the women already had all of the like financial bearing and entrepreneurial experience to make these restaurants what they were. So as you can probably see, our book aims to go beyond the kind of white and great man uh, history of dining out, which I have to say, lots of the history that is told about food is from that perspective, right? Um, and like many texts with white authors, we could probably more fully account for Black lives in restaurant culture. Um, for example, 19th century Black caterers are really central to American dining and tastes, and um, I am, I still look at the book and I'm surprised because we didn't give them their due. Uh, but we do do include uh, black entrepreneurs in our discussions about both the democratization of restaurants and the perennial importance of local restaurants even in the rise of global chains. And I wanna highlight two of those entrepreneurs really quickly, um, Thomas Downing and Rodney Scott. Uh, and also, I just love this picture. <laughs> so Thomas Downing, is uh, basically ran a 19th century oyster house. When he started running this 19th century oyster house, oyster houses were, um, they were popular places, but they were not upscale places. Um, they were often uh, places that uh, the well-to-do didn't go. And he really transformed that. Um, so Downing, uh, Began, grew, uh, was born as a free black man in Virginia, and he grew up working with oysters. And when he came to New York in uh, 1918, he began his own oyster business. So he was, uh, he was cultivating his own oysters and raking them in the Hudson. Maybe 1818. Oh, I'm sorry, 18, it's actually 1819. I just flipped them. <laughs> um, uh, and then by 1825, he uh, had earned enough money to buy a building. And so he basically bought a building and then a series of basements. Because if you have oysters, one of the things you want to do is you want to be able to keep them in a basement with constantly running water over them, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and so he basically bought this building and started creating a kind of oyster house house that was not meant to be rough and tumble, but was really set up like the kinds of fine restaurants that Elliot was showing earlier, right? That had these big mirrors that had heavy velvet curtains and that had like really high-end clientele. He also was known for having really high-end oysters, um, which some of that was because he cultivated his own oysters and people were impressed at what he did. But also he was really great at working the the system of sourcing. So he would go out super early in the morning to the boats where the oysters were and he would talk with, uh, talk with the guys who were selling them and he would take all of the best oysters for himself and then he would go back into town and then when they would come on shore to sell their oysters, he would then be like, oh, I will go and bid them up without any reason, like any plan to buy them. So basically he helped his colleagues drive up the cost of their oysters. He basically made it so that his competition was paying more money for an inferior product. And I think really like cultivated this sense of, um, of like uh, good business practice and also of like making sure that he always had the best, the best oysters that you could get in New York at that point. Um, and because of that, people like Charles Dickens and Queen Victoria and a litany of other people whose names we don't know anymore um, uh, came and dined at his restaurant. In turn, he really invested his wealth into his family and into the abolitionist movement. Um, so uh, his family was part of the Underground Railroad and his son, George T. Downing, became a really important civil rights leader uh, um, from the 1830s through Reconstruction. 
So the other person I want to talk about is 100 years later. So more than a century later, Rodney Scott uh, also made success by attending to ingredients, almost two centuries later, I guess, actually, um, and drawing diverse crowds. So Scott's Barbecue is in Hemingway, South Carolina. And e even if you've never heard of Hemingway, South Carolina, you still might, that might ring a bill, bell because it's also where Sylvia Woods, who is another great uh, black restaurateur in Harlem. It's where she came from as well. So it's this teensy tiny city that has like two of our most important uh, food entrepreneurs in America. Um, so his family has had a restaurant there since the 70s. And what's really amazing about this barbecue restaurant is that they are tree to table. Um, so Rodney Scott and his family, they cultivate a whole bunch of woods. They cut down the trees themselves. They, uh, he actually worked with a local blacksmith to design the barrels that they use to turn that wood into the charcoal that they use. Um, he has close relationships, again, thinking about how people source things um, with, uh, with many of the um, pig farmers uh, in his area and gets the right kinds of pigs for his barbecue. Um, and, then, uh, and then it all just gets sold in this wonderful, tiny place at prices that everybody can afford. Um, and because of that, he, he also has just like this expansive clientele. Um, and in 2009, uh, John T. Edge wrote an article about him that really led to a flurry of interest in the kind of work that he was doing with this like tree to table barbecue um, and also uh, about him as a person and people were like, we want to franchise your operation. We want you to sell sauce, right? Like he was given all kinds of offers. And through this, he really like stuck to his guns that part of what they do well, like can't be expanded quickly. It can't be replicated, that it's really about a kind of commitment to a practice. And at the same time, he's managed to stay committed to this practice and really have a national presence. Um, so he, he often cooks in other places. He does festivals. Um, and I think that it's that he is like such a wonderful example of um, someone who uh, manages to maintain the kinds of traditions that he is invested in. And at the same time, he like really is an amazing businessman. He uh, his restaurant burned down in 2013, and he managed to work with colleagues to raise money to build a new one, and then opened a second restaurant in 2016 um, that's two hours from the first one. Anyway, also, you should know, it is the best barbecue you will ever have. Uh, so if you're ever in Hemingway after this happens, you should go. So... Well, we wanted to tell the story of great black entrepreneurs, we also tried to acknowledge the long fight that black diners have had with racism in America. Um, and one of the stories that we tell is that of Victor Green's Green Book, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, and then also the reporting of black papers like the Baltimore Afro-American. So really briefly, just because I think that especially since so many people's exposure to the Green Book was through that movie a couple of years ago, I think it's really important to know more about the person who made this text. Um, so Victor Green was the Green Book's uh, editor and creator. Um, and basically what the Green Book did was it provided a place for people to go to know where they could eat when they were on the road that would be safe, right? So if you were a black person traveling in America in 1937, where were you going to stop and get gas and where were you going to stop and eat so, so that you like literally did not get killed? Um, he himself was a postman and he didn't travel a lot, but because he was a postman, he had an access to this entire network of postmen. So with the first book, he really relied on his colleagues in the postal service um, to send him uh, lots of their ideas and the places that they knew were good. Um, to gather intelligence for later books, uh, he really solicited directly from uh, people who 
were in his community from African-American uh, tourism and business people, and then also from readers of the Green Book. He paid all of his contributors, um, and he funded the book with advertising money. Um, and uh, Julian Bond says, said of the Green Book that it's a guidebook that, not told, that told you not where the best places were to eat, but where there, were any, where there was any place. Um, and so it was a really important text uh, from 1936 to 1964 when it ceased publication um, after uh, restaurants were desegregated by the Civil Rights Act. Um, so while Green was doing this work to make eating safer for Black people when they traveled in America, there were other people who were clearly fighting to desegregate restaurants. Um, and while many of us are probably familiar with stories like those of the sit-ins at Woolworths, um, historians like Audrey Russick have worked to make sure that we know other kinds of stories as well. And Elliot's gonna tell you one of those. So right after John F. Kennedy becomes president, <clears throat> there are a series of um, African diplomats who come to the United States. And they come to the United States starting around 1961 to meet with the president and to visit the country. And one of those diplomats was driving across Pennsylvania and stopped at Howard Johnson's. We haven't talked about Howard Johnson's. We do talk about Howard Johnson's in the book. In Hagerstown and um, Maryland, actually, and um, he and the diplomat was refused service, and it became a national incident. And these national incidents continued until there was an uproar in Washington, and nothing was happening. So, the editor of the Baltimore Afro American, which was the um, the black newspaper in Baltimore, decided that he was going to try something that would change the mood in the country. So what he did was he had three of his colleagues dress up like the way they look right there. These are American black men, two dressed up in, um, in tuxedos and one dressed up in African royal dress. And they tour around Baltimore and go out to Hagerstown and go around Maryland and try to eat dinner. And in many cases, they are able to do that because of the way, because they say they're African and not African-American. There are a couple of places where they are stopped from eating. And there's, this becomes a huge splash in the newspaper in the, in the Baltimore Afro-American and becomes the the actual tool that is used by the African-American community to change the laws and change the rules in, um, in the first state south of the Mason-Dixon line to allow for integrated eating. So it, it took a, um, a sort of a, a parlor trick, and, um, but a way to expose the um, hypocrisy and what, was, and what um, I think you could say that Katie was saying before about what was true for women in the early 20th century has been true for black folks for a much longer time as we know right now. So we want to actually end this part of the conversation with another story, not from the US, that has similar kinds of eerie kinds of um, connections. And then we'd love to take your questions. I saw a couple of questions that um, we really need to answer for you because I think we skipped over a few things so that we can get as much of these stories out to you. So um, we're gonna move to Berlin in the 1920s. And some of you have probably seen Babylon Berlin, which has been a huge hit. Um, this is a typical example of the um, Mocha Efti, which was a real restaurant in um, in Berlin, which is in that um, series. But this was the biggest restaurant in the world. And it was on Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. And it served 1 million meals a year. It had a 2000 seat cafe. It had a huge cinema. 
and it had, by the end of its time, um, 12 other restaurants in it as well. And uh, the list of restaurants is, is give you a sense of what was going on. Um, there's a, there are two German restaurants, one from Bavaria and one from the Rhineland. There's a Turkish cafe, which I think we have a picture of. Oh, this is the one, that, the first, the one before that. One before that is the Löwenbräu, the um, Bavarian restaurant. You see the Bavarian Alps out there, and it's sort of highly stylized. And then the next one you'll see is the Turkish cafe. Um, with the long view and the, the short view of it. There was a, a Spanish bodega, a Hungarian restaurant, an American Wild West bar, an Austrian restaurant. And um, once the Nazis take over in Germany, they add two more restaurants. You could probably guess which ones they are, a Japanese tea house and an Italian osteria. Now what this was, we think, is the first um, what the Germans call a, a Leibniz gastronomy, sort of a, a kind of celebratory, but also performative way of eating and essentially eating around the globe. It was going to be the place that um, people in Berlin would go to essentially sort of have this incredible immersive experience. And one of the Turkish cafes important to us for this story and also the American Wild West Bar. So we don't have a picture of the Wild West Bar, but the American Wild West Bar was completely um, staffed by um, people of color, um, probably African Germans. Um, some people thought they were African Americans and they were supposed to be African American cowboys. So you start seeing this kind of insane um, mixture of an ethnic restaurant, a performative place, a place where you hang out, a place where you could eat the entire world in, in one place. And I wanted to point to um, one person who sort of embodies what we're talking about here. And for those of you who know German, you probably can see the end of this story. Um, this is Bayoum Mohammed Hussein who is actually from Zaire, Dar es Salaam, and um, he is used as a waiter in the Turkish restaurant, he wears a fez, and in the Wild West bar, he wears a cowboy hat, and he becomes uh, actually quite beloved by the people who come there. So he's sort of performing himself in other kinds of ways that we, I think, from what Katie was talking about before, give you a sense of, of how the restaurant itself is implicated in all of the kinds of cultural things that we are now um, experiencing in this country. And this happens in Germany in the 1920s. Um, by the 1930s, um, the, uh, 1937, the restaurant is taken away from its Jewish owners. There are, um, there are actually uh, Jewish symbols uh, built into the Haus Vaterland name and they're taken down. Um, and the, uh, some of the people, some of the owners um, died in concentration camps and some of them got away. Um, Bayou Mohammed Hussein was arrested in, eight, in 1941 and taken to the Sachsenhaus prison uh, um, concentration camp where he died in 1944. This is an example of what the Germans have been doing for the last decade or so of placing um, what are called Stolpersteine or um, stumbling blocks, stumbling stones in front of his house. That's where it is in Berlin. So if we move forward to after the war, this is Haus Vaterland in 1947. Um, it was actually in business up to this time and a little bit longer. One side of it was on the, um, in East Berlin and the other side of it was in West Berlin. So it becomes a sort of totem and this um, notion of, um, you know, what a restaurant could be over time um, and throughout place and sort of 
exhibits a lot of the kinds of things we've been talking about, a lot of the tensions, a lot of the joys of being in the restaurant, and um, a lot of the sort of violence that um, embodies some of the stories we've been telling. So we thought that um, in this moment, this is a story that we needed to tell you, and we'd be happy to talk some more about that and all of the other stories we've talked about today. And we, we welcome your questions and we love the fact there are so many people here and um, to hear our story. And of course, we'd love it if you buy our book. So thank you very much. Um, and we're happy to take some questions. Hi, everyone. Um, if you have any questions, please just put them in the chat and I'll pass them along. And thank you for the talk, Katie and Elliot. And I saw a couple of uh, questions in the chat while we were speaking. Yeah, let's see. It looks like the first one is, what about food and taverns and inns? Uh, maybe you're separating these from restaurants. So I, I did not mention that when I was trying to describe what the, the definition of a restaurant is as we understand it. So taverns and inns didn't have all of those um, categories. They didn't have a menu often. They didn't, um, they only had one food available. That was it. Um, they would not have necessarily waiters and uh, waiters at that time. And they wouldn't have necessarily seats for you to eat at. You might be standing or you might be standing at a bar, you might be eating outside. So there are places to eat um, from, um, you know, out, outdoors for a very long time. The, the story of eating together is a very old one. It starts with religious experiences and cultural experiences um, in uh, very early times. And um, of course, there are places to eat and drink in cities like in Rome and in Athens in the West. So all of those ideas come together, not at, and to become the restaurant that we know, the ones that we're missing so badly, um, not the ones where you just pull something out of a, a mechanical drawer or you just stand at a bar and have a hamburger with a beer. So that's what we, that's why I didn't say. So I, that's why I saw that question early on and I was sorry I didn't say that, but that's what we're trying to say. The restaurant that we know is fairly new. Um, the, the kind of restaurant that we're describing in France only comes to the US in the early 19th century. So that kind of a restaurant that has the whole panoply of what we love when we go into a decent restaurant or even a not so great restaurant of the interaction with the waiter or waitress and a menu and a price that we know we can afford and, and things that we think were cooked for us and just for us. Mm -hmm. And the next one is, were there automats across the East Coast? I'd always heard that heard that Horn and Hardart's um, were only in Philadelphia and New York. So, yes, they are in Philadelphia and New York. Um, they, they they scatter between it. Isn't that all of the East Coast? Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> you can probably tell that Katie, when she talked about the barbecue, did not live very far in South Carolina from the barbecue joint. So I, I was wondering about that too, Katie. <laughs> So yes, they're Philadelphia. They start in Philadelphia and they move to New York, and they stay in Philadelphia. I went to them when I was a kid, and um, I, I um, and the New York Public Library actually sort of reproduced one, didn't they, Katie? While you were yeah, in 2012, uh, they they basically reset one up for people to experience along with an exhibit, which I think is really exciting. And the last ones in New York, I think, were there until the mid 90s, maybe even the early 2000s. Um, but by the end of it, they were really novelty spaces instead of the kinds of like everyday life places that they had been before. And the, if I remember correctly, at the New York Public Library, you could open up one of the drawers, but you get a, a, a recipe instead of a, a piece of apple pie, so. I have to take it home and make your own. Yes, exactly. <laughs> When did restaurants become popular in department stores, and where were some of the first department store restaurants? That's a really, you know, that is something we do not cover in the book. Um, 
but a very interesting question. I do know about restaurants in the great department stores in, especially in Philadelphia, especially in John Wanamaker's, which were built in to, which was built into that building uh, on the top floor. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Katie, do you? No, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the beginning of restaurants in department stores, but I do know that um, many of the early or uh, many of the early restaurants that were like explicitly for women and were part of like the rise of this kind of like luncheon culture um, were also in shopping spaces. Um, and so I don't know that that's the beginning of them, but it would make sense to me if they were. One of the, um, the places where restaurants first go, these, these great restaurants that we were thinking about, the French restaurant, were to huge hotels. So it was the hotel that was the place that then became the place where the restaurant developed. So there were these independent restaurants, um, like Delmonico's, in, which is the first restaurant in the United States that fits the definition that we were talking about. Um, but then very quickly you get the development of the hotel restaurant. And, and all of them, essentially, all of these high-end hotels had the same menus because they all had Parisian chefs who all use the same cookbooks. So it was kind of fascinating to see the development of cuisine was for often for the upper class and the upper middle class that traveled around the world and literally ate the same food in a hotel in Shanghai or in uh, Milan. And it's, you know, it's almost kind of like, if you think about um, chains, which we spend a lot of time with in the book itself, um, there is some comfort in having the kind of food that you're used to, just like the Chinese um, travelers in Kaifeng and Hangzhou would not eat at a restaurant that didn't serve their own food. I lived in uh, Taiwan for a couple of years and um, it was very hard to go out with a group of Chinese folks who came from different parts of China because they couldn't agree on which restaurant we would go to. So we ended up going to a restaurant that none of them were from. So that was, that was, the, um, that was the compromise. And of course, they all hated the food. But anyway, it wasn't their food. So a good compromise. Um. Yeah, it's like I've heard people make fun of um, people going to the Olive Garden in Times Square and then a defense of it is that if you're a tourist in New York City, the options are overwhelming, but at least at Olive Garden, you know what's on the menu what, and what you're going to get. What you're going to pay. Yep. Let's see, I have to scroll up because we've gotten a bunch of questions come in. Um, let's see. When did chefs start becoming celebrities such as Steven Starr and what caused celebrity status? Yeah, so the first kind of celebrity chefs that we look at in the book are people um, in uh, the 1600s in Japan. Uh, and many of these people uh, aren't necessarily restaurant chefs. They're often tea house chefs. Um, and so uh, in that sense, they aren't, they are making food for a public, but it's often uh, a private public, if that makes sense. Um, and these are people who basically, as part of tea house culture, get like a real reputation. They often then have texts and schools that come up out of them, these kinds of like notions of secret knowledge, which is basically just the idea that they would have like a kind of at least culturally proprietary um, way of cooking things, set of dishes that they used, um, and that lots of that would be about, in the same way that it is true of celebrity chefs now, like a lot of it is about the kinds of identities that people want to see and like understand a certain kind of food and a kind of person to have. So there's like one school that's like very staid and another school that is all about ostentatiousness. Um, so that's like really where you get some of these like first uh, publicly known um, chef names. And then by, yeah. That you were talking about handed those traditions down and some of them still exist, right? They do, yeah. yeah. Yep. We're talking about the 20th generation or so of some of these families or 15th generation. 
That's right. And they still they still carry these original people's names. So it's like if in hundreds of years people become uh, followers of Star, right? Um, which we might see with some things. Uh, so one of the other uh, things that we talk about later in the book is the um, like the Nordic Manifesto, um, and so people out of these like. Nordic cuisine traditions that uh, became super popular in the mid to late decade, first decade of the 21st century, right? Um, so at Noma. Um, and those things, I think, have the potential to be these same kinds of like schools that are really initially brought about by star power and then stay on because they have a kind of food tradition that people like want to embrace and continue to believe in. And in, in the West, in France, it happens within a generation that there are star cooks and star, and they publish their own cookbooks and they start their own, essentially, sort of lineage themselves. So it's, it's an old, old kind of, um, it comes pretty quickly with the restaurant in the West. And uh, Sawyer, the guy that I mentioned who was like part of inventing the sink traps and he was also super important in uh, popularizing the gas stove in restaurants. Um, he also had a very early line of cookware. Um, so he was basically like the first kind of emerald pot that you could get was uh, a Sawyer pot. <laughs> so you kind of invented that concept. Um, next one is career Philadelphia server here, formerly Liat Zahav. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little about the differences between American restaurant and European restaurant culture, where in Europe it is essentially an extension of your living room and a $4 glass of wine buys you a seat all day, whereas in the U.S. a $17 glass of wine essentially buys you an amusement park ride ticket for maybe two hours, not to mention tax and tip. Oh. Well, it's not true in all European um, restaurants that you could sit there all day, but <laughs> especially slightly higher end French ones, um, you have to leave at a certain time. In Germany, you can stay forever in a restaurant and never be kicked out. Um, it's a very, very good question and a very interesting one and probably take us a very long time to answer it. I mean, for example, what else you can do? Uh, I know German restaurants probably um, better than French and um, English and Dutch restaurants and Italian restaurants I know pretty well in, in Europe. But in Germany, you can bring your dog to the restaurant and it sits with you, just like you saw in that suite. That automat uh, picture would not have been strange and it still would not be strange right now if you brought your dog to the restaurant in Europe. Um, and I think there are, I, I think the answers to these kinds of um, questions have much more to do with the cultures of these um, two worlds, and we're seeing those two worlds sort of clash in, in particularly uh, unhappy ways right now. And um, it, it might have often to do with speed. In Italy, you can also sit forever and you're supposed to eat as, you know, every, many courses. Um, when I lived in Taiwan, you were supposed to eat to the point of passing out, and that was a sign you were a good guest. So there are all kinds, I think a lot of these things are culturally determined. Katie, do you wanna take a stab? It's a great question. It is a, it is a great question. And I do think it's interesting to think about um, how much of it is framed around, uh, around work culture. Yeah, and like cultural approaches to time. Like I think about how one of the, so one of the things we talk about in the book is um, how in the United States that really um, people working away from home is part of one of the like big drivers of restaurants in the United States. It's like when in New York people stop living next to where they work and they start living uh, in more northern parts of the city and working in more southern parts of the city and as people go further and further from living right next to their work and end up having lunch at work, right, like that there is this sense that they're food is about fuel as opposed to leisure. And I don't know how much of that feeds into these like other larger pieces of, of difference in the rep.
Um, how did prohibition impact the restaurant industry? Do you want me to repeat that one? No, you don't have to repeat uh, it. I'm trying to uh, think. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. It is a big question. I don't think I, I know the answer to that. So I'm not, I don't think either of us probably. That's a very good question. Well, you know what's great about these questions? We now know what the second revised edition is going to include. It's I guess not about the U.S., although we skewed it a little bit more to the U.S. here. Um, it really is an attempt to cover the, the whole spectrum. And um, so, you know, not, not an excuse, just an explanation. Okay, I guess I've never thought about if like speakeasies served food or anything. I'm sure someone knows that answer. Um, next one, a little bit like the question on taverns, but do you separate restaurants from pubs, i.e. public houses in the British culture? So, you know, if, if you think about pubs before the restaurant moment, um, one of the things we did mention before, there's something called uh, a table d'hote, which is a, um, essentially a meal that's spread out usually about two o'clock in the afternoon for people to, and you pay a specific amount of money, and uh, and then you get anything that's that's sitting, you know, on the at the buffet. It's essentially a buffet, and you get something to drink with it, which is probably the origin that of the issue of food in pubs, and. Um, in the English context, um, not necessarily in the um, in the Central European context, but what you um, see in most of the um, pub cultures in I can give you examples from um, Switzerland and Germany. Uh, these were places where they were forbidden by law to serve food, so um, there had you had to then join a group that were members. And this is actually something true in the United States. It was true in the Midwest. If you wanted to get a drink in a restaurant, when I was writing my dissertation and I was in Missouri, I had to pay a dollar and join the restaurant. And then they could give me some really bad beer. So um, some of the laws in Europe were about what was allowed to be served and what wasn't allowed to be served in a place where you could drink. So the, um, the British also, and there's a place called Rules, which is still in London, which essentially had a specific limited number of things that you could get and you'd pay a couple of shillings for it and that's what you'd get and then you could also drink. So it, it's not really a restaurant, it's sort of like uh, you know one or two things that you could eat. So it's, it's a complicated story that, um, that is different in most countries. And uh, the Brits are a little bit more like um, the US Americans in terms of trying to um, control um, drinking than uh, some of the um, European countries. Katie, do you wanna add anything to that? I think the only other thing I would add is that one of the things that you see is um, the restaurantization of many uh, drinking establishments and um, like in establishments, other kinds of places that were serving food and like were clearly places where you could dine out before. Um, but as restaurants rise across the 19th century, you see that these places um, move to including more smaller tables for individual parties. They move to having menus as well. They move to doing some of these things that are basically adopted from the culture of restaurants. And in most um, British pubs still that I know, you have to go up to a counter and order the food and pay for it. And then sometimes they'll bring it to you, but most times you have to go get it. So it's, it's, um, it's a different kind of a story. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of um, Philadelphia's, and I'm not sure how much these are across Pennsylvania, but the stop and go issue of people trying to skirt the, or the requirement of serving food on premises if you're serving like single serve beers or whatever and you have to have a certain amount of chairs so they have like five bags of chips and some folding chairs to be like a eating establishment here i think it's it's about the local legal system Let's see um someone 
asks, I would be curious about dining on the African continent. I know you didn't cover that in the book. Um, dining traditions are old and interesting too, and great presentation. Katie, do you want to talk about the government? Yeah, so um, we, <laughs> I feel super frustrated about the fact that we don't have a lot about um, dining on the African continent, like other than uh, we do have a section about uh, dining in Egypt. Um, uh, so we talk some about cook shops in Cairo. Uh, but one of the things that the literature, so food studies doesn't have the kind of literature that we would want it to have, right? Like there are lots of things to still explore and lots of the literature on about dining on the African continent um, is really, uh, comes out of colonial interactions um, rather than being stories about um, African dining traditions becoming restaurant traditions, like the stories that are about those traditions often end up not being stories about restaurants, but are stories about other ways of dining. Um, and so I, I think there is probably a really great uh, chapter, book, article, several books probably, to be written on, on that, um, but we just didn't have the source base when we were writing the book, which I was really disappointed about. It wasn't what I expected when we started. I was so certain we were going to be like six continents, um, but that didn't happen. The next one you'll have to have Africa and then the McMurdo station in Antarctica. This is going to be a much bigger book. Why did America develop so many Chinese and Italian restaurants and not, for example, Irish or Polish restaurants, although the immigration rates were as high? There are Polish and um, Irish restaurants. Um, you're right, there aren't as many. Um, it's an interesting question. I think that what um, the Chinese story is actually a long story that we tell in our book. It's also a long story in in England as well. And it's um, a story of immigration and um, people who are being essentially shunned and um, are feeding themselves and then people start to discover it and it becomes um, something that a lot of people eat. Whereas I, I'm, I'm guessing at this, I think this is probably true, um, a Polish and Irish um, cuisine was um, off, I mean, we're, we're talking about another issue too. We're talking about um, class as well, because if you are um, in a working class situation, you're not necessarily going to restaurants of this, you know, you're, you might be going to a place to get some food. You might be going to a, 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 a like a cook shop, which could be like what we think of as a deli now, where you would go in and get the kinds of things you need and, and take them with you. So it's, um, I think it's, it's tied up in those kinds of issues. And I also think it's tied up um, that both the Chinese and Italian stories are a willingness to change the cuisine to, to be um, acceptable to British and American palates, which I think is, a, is the biggest part of the story, I would imagine. Katie, would you agree? I mean, what the, the kind of, um, Italian restaurant you were talking about before, Corinne, isn't really an Italian restaurant. And the food that was Chinese food before there was a rediscovery of quote unquote real Chinese food was not something that you could probably get in China. So it was, a, it was an American version of a kind of a food that became a popular thing because it appealed to certain kind of tastes that um, were palatable to Americans. Is that a fair thing to say, Katie? I mean, I think, I think yes. Also, one of the one of the arguments about like uh, the success of ethnic restaurant tours is that often they are mixing um, uh, the novel with the familiar, right? So that they're like writing that line between things that people know and also kind of a sense of excitement um, about what is new. I do wonder if, um, 
I think this is such a good question because every every answer that I come up with that I'm like, oh, well, maybe it's maybe it's about this aspect of like the kind of that was available for people to do. Um, I like doesn't quite hold for all of the groups. Um, but I, you know, like uh, in the Chinese case, the fact that uh, people couldn't necessarily labor in all fields because of legal restrictions meant that you you could do uh, food work, you could do laundry work. And so like that's another reason that you might get concentrations of restaurants and, and like food service in particular communities. But like that, doesn't hold for the Italians, so. Corinne, you should unmute. Yeah, got a little alert from Zoom. Um, does the roadside diner fit into your story? Certainly not a place for the elite. Katie, do you want to take this one? Sure, yes, it does. We, we have a whole chapter that's really about uh, dining on the road and um, and dining on the road is I feel like the if one thinks about restaurants about the history of restaurants as having like a couple of turns so there is this moment when um, when you first get restaurants and there are these kinds of elite spaces and then there's the kind of democratization of restaurants that are still often in cities um, and then when you have people moving to the road. One of the things that you get that Elliot was even suggesting in these like high-end hotel dining that was all the same is this notion of having a kind of like replicability. So roadside diners um, often end up being replicable whether they are parts of chains like Howard Johnson's, which we can talk about, or whether even they're like independent places, in part because um, lots of them were uh, buying from the same kind of purveyors, right? Like if we think about um, these these very specific, uh, and I at one point I had a picture of this in our slides and I took it out. Um, there were patents for these like food wagons and these diners so that people would basically buy this kind of trailer this basically like modular building so that they could really cheaply put up a place where people could eat um, that was like a way to establish a restaurant um, and so in that way like it it looked like lots of other places and often shared menus with other places as well. Yeah, and they would move and they wouldn't necessarily um, be open all year long. They would probably only be open in the warmer months. So it's, it's, it was also a continuing kind of change. And this is also why lots of the big uh, like kinds of fast food chains come out of the Sun Belt is because a lot of this really grows out of car culture um, and initially car culture is much more seasonal than it is today. Yeah, it reminds me of hearing that um, in France there's kind of a shift in in what a lot of bistros sold as they, I guess, larger companies bought a lot of what had been independent bistros and they all started getting from the same suppliers and the menus became, and the cooking became, people are saying more identical between them, which may bring it back kind of to their roots. Um, and this may have been answered, but um, for Philadelphia, what was the first restaurant? Hmm. Or the oldest restaurant in Philadelphia. I don't know off the top of my head, I'm sorry to say, nor does Katie. Another, another area that we need to learn more. <laughs> By the way, the, the, um, you know, in some ways, one of the things that we talk about in the restaurant is it's now become more so typical to go to restaurants that cooking at home and having a meal for people is the special occasion whereas the going to the restaurant used to be the special occasion and the day we started writing the book the um it was true that in the united states people started to spend more than more money eating in restaurants or taking home prepared foods than buying in grocery stores and supermarkets. So it, it tipped 
in the middle of the 2000 teens that we, you know, that eating in a restaurant is so normal now, except it isn't, um, that we think that cooking in home is kind of cool and it's, it's the new eating at restaurants and something. But we will try to find out the answer and we will try to send it along to, to you and Susan and she can send it out to the folks who are here. And we can include that in our follow-up. Right. Uh, what is, um, what is interesting is the change from dining out to dining in. Um, I, as a person from another country, was used to dining out being a big event and taking the whole evening. And I was stunned moving to America that you had a two hour window. Um, can you talk about that change, especially in the current or recent environment? And that's a, kind of a natural follow up to what you were just saying, it sounds like. Well, and it's also what Katie was saying before about the notion of, um, you know, time and money and uh, things shouldn't take too long. People eat too quickly, often, people think, in the US. Um, and that the restaurant is a place to earn money uh, from people and not necessarily this kind of convivial sense. There are American restaurants that do that, um, where you can sit there um, forever, um, but, and they only rent out the table for one person for one night. Usually the cost of that is prohibitive in the United States. And it's about a very high end way of thinking you have enough time and enough money to spend your time in this leisurely way. Um, but it's really not what you should be doing kind of thing. It's only something for the super rich. So it's a, I think it's what Katie was saying before. This is a huge cultural difference that plays out in the restaurant in the US and plays out in some other countries as well but um, certainly, um, you know, not everywhere. And I think Katie had her finger on that when she said that before. There you go again. Um, two comments to pass along are that Utah still has the membership thing, um, and also so does Philadelphia's um, pop-up beer gardens have, though those are free, you still have to become a member. Um, and there's a documentary about Horn and Harder, it's called The Automat, that's nearly completed. Um, and this will be the last question, and just what, any thoughts about the rise and fall of theme restaurants like Planet Hollywood and Rainforest? I'm going to let Katie go for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cruel. You're the one that talked about House Slaughterland. Um, so, uh, so I think that these restaurants we don't we don't talk about them in the book, um, but they really are following in this same kind of like event dining um, experience that that uh, House Slaughterland really was like an early version of, which are which are these kinds of like theme park spaces. Um, I I don't know why they rose and fell um that is that seems interesting it also seems really interesting to me to think about like i think those things were super popular in the 90s like what happened in that moment that we have now like also gotten over um so i think it's a i th think it's a great question uh also they are interesting because they're also spaces that are like olive garden in the sense that they are chains um that they do have like really familiar menus um, and yet, like, there's this notion of, like, the space around you as the thing that is being celebrated, which I think in some ways is the thing that I've discovered that I miss most about restaurants right now. Like, the idea that that my house is nice and everything. I'm happy that I have it. Uh, <laughs> but I would much rather be in the kinds of interiors that someone else has designed as an experience. Um, and those are like clearly obvious experiences of interiors, but like if we think about Zahav, that is also clearly a cultivated experience of an interior. But I don't, can't actually answer the question. Mm -hmm. I, I think this also ties to the question before about eating quickly here and not, you know, and taking one's time. It's, if eating out is a form of entertainment and not a form of conviviality or conversation, um, then why not a theme restaurant, right? Or why not something, a pod restaurant or a, you know, in other words, you're, you're going there not necessarily to eat, 
and not necessarily to have a conversation or have a quiet sort of set of conversations, but you're there to experience them. So you're absolutely right. It is like house potter line. Um, you know, let's, let's, you know, you don't, we can have coffee in the Turkish cafe, you can have dessert at the Bavarian Alps, and you could watch um, in, in one, <laughs> one of the places there, uh, the Rhine Terrasse, the Rhine restaurant, you could watch the, um, the Lorelei, you could watch um, the ships go by where the Lorelei is, and there would be a uh, thunderstorm on the hour and actual water came down and hit, it's, it was hitting the patrons, so they had to put up a glass barrier. And there were little airplanes flying around. So, you know, we're talking about the 1920s and it's, you know, I'm sure the food was probably pretty bad, but the experience was fun. So it, it's not just an American notion. And one last thing about House Patalam before we turn off, um, it was designed by somebody who had spent a lot of time at Coney Island in New York. So that's where the idea came from. So it's, it's also a sort of German-American kind of production. Yeah, thank you both. And thank you everyone for the great questions as usual. They were uh, thank you for having us. Thank you, Elliot and Katie and Corinne for a great program. And um, we really would like you to come back. I think you've touched the tiniest bit of an incredible history. So thanks so much and come all join us again. <laughs>